In this video, I'm going to go over how you can convert either a Fender Hot Rod Deluxe or Hot Rod DeVille into a two-channel amp that basically is a combination of the legendary Fender 59 Bassman and the Marshall Plexi. Hopefully you enjoy. So probably the first question we need to look at is what is a Hot Rod Fender amp? Bottom line is that this is a entry-level tube amp which is a bit of a compromise combining Fender's tweed and blackface models and trying to add a few modern twists to it that would be something a little more on the Marshall line. Starting in the mid 90s Fender came out with a family that basically had a 40 watt, a 60 watt, and then a 15 watt amp. The Hot Rod Deluxe and Hot Rod DeVille, both shown here, are using two 6L6 tubes. The Deluxe is a 40 watt, the DeVille is a 60 watt, and they wind up having this split basically because the power transformer is stronger in the Hot Rod DeVille. Also when you look at the shape here of these combo amps, the Deluxe is pretty close in size to the original 57 Deluxe, and the DeVille is a 4x10 that lines up with the 59 Baseman. The Blues Junior, which is not shown here, runs two EL84 tubes. Basically has the same circuitry, but is not quite as complex. At this point, you might be asking, why would you do a modification on this amp? As with a lot of modern tube amps, there are some benefits to how this amp was designed, but there also are a few key problems. And when you go through and you try to fix these problems, Usually the cost associated with it really doesn't justify what you're going to do. And to make a mod like I did often is less expensive. So now to talk about a few common problems. By far the biggest problem is that of the screen resistors and how they're mounted on the board. They generally tend to burn up and you get a really nice high pitched squeal. Next is the use of linear tapered pots on volume controls. Not sure why they made this decision. There are a lot of things written online saying they were trying to trick people into thinking the amp would be louder. But at the end of the day, you don't have very good volume control. Following that is the issue that is related to a lot of modern tube amps, how they try to reduce costs and use PCBs. And in particular, they mount the power tubes to the PCB. So the socket is on the PCB instead of being on its own. Now you have a super hot tube sitting on something that's not made to run at a high temperature. The potential for long-term problems related to this is pretty high and I think at the end of the day really is the true reason justifying going through and rebuilding this amp. Now I do want to give a side note here about PCBs. Just about everything we use in this world that's electronic uses a PCB and in no way does it mean that an amplifier is going to be bad. You can see examples here of Soldano's SL-100 and also the PV-5150 and all the PVs come as a PCB. None of them have any problems like this and the reason is because they were designed properly to deal with the heat from the tubes. With that being said, this isn't always the case and if you look at the Gatologist channel you'll see he's been having a nightmare with a Mesa Boogie where there's been all kinds of PCB problems and I can tell you that there are lots of other amps that are made the same way. So just be mindful of this. Like I said, it's not due to the PCB, but it's due to the way the PCB was designed. Finally, these amps generally sound lousy. As soon as you turn them up and try to play them in a band situation, in particular if you record them, they just do not measure up to their past counterparts with the Fender name. Many try to attribute this to the transformers or you know, the speakers and other components, but the truth is the circuit is wired in a way that's a compromise. If you look at the way that the preamp section has been wired and biased, and then you throw in the fact that you've actually got solid state amplification in there as well, it just doesn't come out sounding the way it would have if it was built in the 50s or 60s. With that being said, the transformers in this amp and the choke as well are actually pretty good. They don't have a center tap, but that's not really a big deal. You're not using a tube rectifier. You can go through and do a bridge rectifier using diodes. 
So now after discussing the problems, let's talk about why this really is the perfect candidate for this kind of mod. And basically, the combination of those problems, what they will cost you to fix it, and then the fact that you've got this combo amp with the perfect size chassis, it's already got its speakers built in, and despite what you might read to the contrary, the tube complement with the existing transformers make these amps great candidates to turn into basically a 59 baseman or a plexi. And finally, they have the right tube complement. You don't even have to go out and buy new tubes. So my solution is that you pull the PCB and get a 59 baseman kit, then do a few mods so that what would be the normal channel has instead been voiced to be a Marshall Plexi. Now you've got effectively two great amps in one. The only big compromise here is that you're losing the switching ability. Really the best way to understand how this works is to do a little sound demonstration. So right now I'm going to put some sounds from before and you're going to notice it doesn't sound very good. The speaker sounds almost like it's blown. But I'll tell you later on when we do the after test it's the same speaker. I've done nothing to it. You'll just have to put up with my subpar playing, but here goes. So here we go on the normal channel. This is supposed to be the clean channel. And you can see what it sounds like. The volume is uh, just shy of being straight up. So now that you've heard that not outstanding sound quality, let's take a look inside at what it is stock. Here's a picture. You can see there's a PCB that actually is laid out quite neatly. Looks very nice on the inside. And uh, we can go through it. But before we go too deep, I do have to give a warning about the shock hazard here. And I'm going to put a link at the bottom about Rob and his great pages, including how to save yourself and drain your caps. These hot rods are supposed to have a way to drain themselves, but I'll tell you, after playing it, I then decided to hook up my meter, and you can see there's over 400 volts in here. That's going to give you a pretty big shock and not be any fun to deal with. I tend to drain my caps by hooking up my meter to the chassis and to one side of one of the capacitors. Then I have a lead with a resistor on it, and when I touch it to the same lead that's hooked up to the meter, I can actually watch it go down in the meter so I can see that it's drained. I apologize for the crappy film quality, but you'll see as soon as I touch that resistor, it all of a sudden drops out super fast. We went from 400 volts down basically to zero, you know, in less than about five seconds. Once the meter is at zero, you're safe to touch things inside. I suggest you touch a few different capacitors just to make sure. But now we can start testing things out and I'm going to show you some of the problems that I spoke of before. First is that of crappy tube sockets. You'll see this 12AX7 is just rocking around and any vibration going on inside the amp is going to cause major problems with that. Let me move on. You can just see the rest of the board here. Here's a nice shot of the pots and as I mentioned before they use linear pots for the volume, which really doesn't make any sense. And trying to change this out is going to be pretty tough. I and mean, you're going to ha basically have to run jumper wires. So that in itself is a good reason to do this mod. And then here is a view of the screen resistors. These actually have been changed out. And when I pull the board, you'll be able to see the burn marks. Here's the underside of the PCB where those screen resistors were. Yeah, this is not ideal, and this definitely causes a lot of problems. 
So after draining the capacitors, the first step in this mod is to remove all of the PCB circuitry. You can now see the empty chassis as I've pulled it out. It's not that hard. Just take your time. You might even be able to sell this. There are so many of these hot rod amps out there. People may want it. And just so you can get an idea of what the circuit board from the 59 baseman looks like and how it fits in the chassis, you can see when you put it in, it lines right up. This is why I said it's perfectly sized. When you actually get everything in place, this is what it looks like, and this is the footprint that it occupies inside that chassis. Plenty of room to do this. You don't even have to put a doghouse on the back side. So now let's talk a little bit about the mods. I can't speak highly enough about Rob Robinette and the great websites he's put in place. And the main mod that I wound up doing for this was making sure to put this Marshall channel in in place of the normal channel. To do that, you effectively replace four parts, which pull a lot of the bass frequencies out and give you that great Marshall tone, as you can see here. The biggest part of this is changing the cathode bypass capacitor and resistor. And you also deal with the plate load resistor, and finally, you're going to change one of your blocking caps. So if you want to know what that looks like, Rob has made some great images and I have attached them here. You'll notice in purple is where the mods are. So here's the stock eyelet board and now you can see what it looks like when it's modified. Again, everything is in purple. This is my uninstalled final board where I have done the modifications we spoke of. I also added another bypass cap in the second stage, basically as a gain mod. Here is a close-up of all the mods that are made in that marshalization, and this is a highlight on that plate load resistor. This is a 0.68 microfarad bypass cap on the second stage. It's a nice little gain mod. I've actually left it on there as permanent. Now I mentioned before about the Marshall mods, but here's actually a full list of all the circuit mods that I did, aside from those with the Marshall part. Really, maybe the greatest has to do with the negative feedback and, of course, putting in an adjustable bias. I highly suggest you read through Rob's page on modifying the baseband. See what you like. Also, feel free to reach out if you have any questions about any of this. I would gladly like to share. So now it's again time to do a little bit of a sound test. What's the point of doing this modification if you can't hear the difference between what it was like before and what it's like after. I've tried my best to line it up. I apologize if the audio quality doesn't quite match, but I think when you hear this, you'll definitely be able to tell the difference. Well, that's about it. Hopefully you enjoyed this, and hopefully this is helpful for you guys in case you have one of these amps and you want to do an upgrade. i got to put a big shout out again to Rob Robinette. His pages are fantastic. Also, look below. You'll see I have some links for some other guys that do amp repair on YouTube, and they have fantastic channels. Highly suggest you get on there, like them, watch their stuff. Please feel free to let me know if you have any questions, comments, anything else. Take care.